新しい剣豪は令和であります。On April 1st, 2019, Chief Cabinet Secretary of Japan Yoshihide Suga held up a placard with two kanji painted on it. These two simple characters provided the Japanese public and the world at large with a name, Reiwa, this being the name of the upcoming Japanese era. Breaking with several generations of precedent, the Japanese Prime Minister and Diet decided to announce the era name a month ahead of the era's start date on May 1st, 2019. As of this video's uploading, the new era, Reiwa, has begun. Akihito, the country's emperor since 1989, a period known as Heisei, has stepped down from the chrysanthemum throne, and his eldest son, Naruhito, has taken on the mantle of emperor. These names, Reiwa and Heisei, are but two of 239 reign names to date. These reign names, known as Gengo or Nengo, span the course of more than 1300 years. The severe changes have occurred in this time span. Until the Nara period, a major era between 710 and 794, Gengo were not consistently declared. Between the 8th century and 1868, Gengo would be declared whenever the imperial court would deem it necessary. Typically, court nobles in charge of deciding upon Gengo would change era names in the event of natural disasters or conflict, believing that leaving behind an earlier period would put these events, and their after effects, in the past. From 1868 onward, however, it was decided that a law of one Gengo per emperor would be declared. Earlier, Gengo could last as short as only a few years, whereas the shortest period since 1868 lasted 13, and the longest, 64. The names of Gengo are decided in secret by leading politicians and representatives of Japanese culture. These individuals consult with one another to determine what the theme of the following reign should be. Following the death of that era's emperor, he posthumously adopts the Gengo as his name, further solidifying his importance as a symbol of the country and of his era. Up until now, the secret committees behind each Gengo have relied on the classical Chinese poetry that established the foundation of the Japanese literary tradition and artistic sensibilities more than a millennium ago. With Reiwa, however, this tradition has been broken, as these two characters were drawn not from a Chinese poem, but from a Japanese poem. Included in the first ever anthology of Japanese verse, the Manyoshu, which was first collected by the imperial court in the 750s. The film camera has been present in all five periods of modern Japan, from the late Meiji era to the current Reiwa era. The cinema of these different periods each have distinct features that embody the cultural and artistic zeitgeists of their time. In studying Japanese film, we can learn not just about the filmmakers, actors, and subjects of these projects. But also about the conditions in which they were made. If we take a look back at the episodes we have produced here on Cinema Nippon in the past two years, we find that they offer a cross section of these artistic and ideological movements since 1868. In honor of the end of Heisei and the dawn of Reiwa, let's take a look back at the episodes thus far of Cinema Nippon to see what they can teach us about the country in the past 151 years. On February 3rd, 1867, Mutsuhito ascended the throne of Japan, becoming the nation's 122nd emperor when legendary rulers are taken into account. His father, Osahito, died four days prior, taking on the posthumous name of Emperor Komei. Komei had spent years in contention with the shogunate, the military leaders of Japan since 1192, who in effect had neutered the throne's true power. In the 1850s, during Komei's reign, the country was visited by foreign powers in an official capacity for the first time in several hundred years. The 1600s and 1700s had seen the arrival of Portuguese missionaries and Dutch traders who brought Christianity and firearms to Japan. However, the 1850s saw the introduction of foreign culture and technology on a grand scale, thanks both to foreign pressure and to Komei's hatred for the shogun. Though Mutsuhito was only an infant at the time, his father made sure to temper the imperial court and its relationship with the shogunate so that Mutsuhito might become a force for change. Upon Komei's death, Mutsuhito was a mere 14 years of age. The boy being essentially a child further opened the door for the influence of his advisors, who saw fit to further Komei's agenda of tearing down the shogun. 
In the second year of Mutsuhito's reign, 1868, the 15th and final shogun of the Tokugawa family, Tokugawa Yoshinobu, stepped down from his position of power, effectively ending the paradigm that had existed between emperor and military for almost 700 years. During Mutsuhito's reign, numerous technological advancements and cultural imports created in the 1600s through the 1800s from abroad were imported. The Tokugawa regime had effectively closed the country after a century of civil war, and thus made it so that the world began to pass Japan by, at least technologically. Japan quickly played catch-up, leading the period of Mutsuhito's reign to become synonymous with modernization alongside its changing government. Naturally, as these technologies began to pour into the country, the photograph and the film camera were soon to follow. The earliest film cameras for the nation arrived in Japan between 1896 and 1897. The multiple major competing companies, those led by Thomas Edison, the Lumiere brothers, and others, all vied for the opportunity to get a foot in the newly opened door in the East. While films weren't exactly quick to catch on in Japan, there was a good bit of interest in their novelty. Specifically, potential filmmakers seemed interested in the camera's ability to record performances of stage plays. While recordings from the 1800s are few and far between, the earliest footage we have today which was shot in Japan is a three-minute portion of a kabuki performance which was produced in 1899. As the market slowly began to increase beyond mere novelty, foreign productions were imported for screening. Given the lack of sound recording for film at the time and the use of intertitles for dialogue or narration, this necessitated translation or, at the very least, localization for a Japanese audience. From this need came the creation of the benshi, a profession we have mentioned several times on the show. Benshi were essentially storytellers in the tradition of rakugo performers or theatrical narrators. While a film would be screened with the accompaniment of music, the benshi would orate to the audience the events and dialogue of the film. As the domestic market began to develop, the benshi continued to play a role in Japanese film. Rather than adopting the use of intertitles in their native language, many filmmakers from the land of the rising sun would instead rely on a scenario upon which a benshi would base his narration at screenings. Thus, by the end of Mutsuhito's reign in 1912, two attributes unique to Japanese film were already observable, their framing being based largely upon the layout of a stage play and the inclusion of a benshi. As is the case globally, numerous Japanese films from this time have been long lost to time, war, and poor preservation. Early film stock was incredibly delicate, and early adopters of the medium didn't typically have the foresight of how culturally important film would become. Thus, as of yet, Cinema Nippon has not truly covered any films produced during the years between 1868 and 1912. Thankfully, given the volatile political and cultural nature of this time, the late Edo period and early Meiji period remain popular settings even today. We've explored this time of transition in several genres, namely the period drama Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji and the comedy film series Samurai Cat. Most prominently, the shaky zeitgeist of this era is best encapsulated in one of our earliest episodes, Bakumatsu Taioden, a comedy film concerned largely with the intersection of old and new. Disenfranchised samurai begrudgingly live adjacent to foreign representatives and grumble about the changes seen in their nation. Like Bakumatsu Taioden, which was produced in 1952 at the end of another era of change, this time period is commonly called back to during instances of great upheaval within Japan, given how integral these changes were to the first modern era. Mutsuhito passed away at the age of 59 on January 30th, 1912. In his time, the country had become an empire, taking possession of several other territories, as it rocketed itself onto the international stage as a major player in the world. Upon his death, Mutsuhito assumed the name preordained for him, Emperor Meiji, and his son, 32-year-old Yoshihito, ascended the throne. Yoshihito's reign is the shortest in modern Japan, a fact commonly blamed upon his poor health throughout the better part of his life. As such, Yoshihito rarely appeared in public and reportedly had a less integral part in the country's government than his father. The government under him was in turn marked by further modernization. 
Between 1912 and 1926, power was shifted largely from his father's oligarchic setup to a parliamentary government called the Diet. After the end of the shogunate, Emperor Meiji's top advisors and some of the top officials from the late Tokugawa regime were given cushy jobs under him. Collectively, this group formed the Meiji Oligarchy, a select group who formed virtually all policy for the country between 1868 and 1912. Japan's parliamentary body, the National Diet, was established in the middle of Meiji's rule in 1889, but in the end proved subservient to the oligarchy for the better part of the period. Under Yoshihito, the Diet was ultimately given more power along with its leader, the Prime Minister. The Diet was meant to represent the people's interest alongside the leadership of the throne, hence a Prime Minister existing alongside the Emperor and his advisors. For this reason, the modernizations of Yoshihito's reign, the Taisho period, are commonly called Taisho democracy. Although this was meant to introduce a balance in power, things were quick to change. Again, due to Yoshihito's illness, his first son, Hirohito, became his regent, or acting ruler, in 1921 at the age of 20. This means that while Yoshihito technically ruled Japan until his death in 1926, he truly reigned for less than a full decade. Hirohito, on the other hand, became something of a parallel for his grandfather, Emperor Meiji, as he was thrust into power and groomed for the throne from a young age. Thanks to the open political discourse and relatively liberal nature of Japan under Yoshihito, a time of even greater experimentation ensued. The arts that were introduced or which had begun to shift during the mid to late Meiji period continued their changes. Women authors and poets became plentiful as the 20th century dawned, alongside the creation of Japan's first female-only literary magazine, as discussed in our episode on Eros Plus Massacre. At the same time, modernist literature was birthed, with authors commingling with their Russian contemporaries and redefining Japanese writing. These authors in turn began to exert influence on the bold avant-garde films of the Taisho period. Most prominently, we've seen this in 1926's A Page of Madness, the scenario of which was a collaborative effort by the Shinkan Kakuha, a collective of young, prominent authors. Given the Meiji period's introduction to Japan of new political ideologies and how authors of the Taisho period were willing to translate foundational texts from European languages, a diversity of political movements also began to crop up at this time. Ideologies like socialism, communism, and anarchism arose during the Taisho period. These occurrences were quickly suppressed, especially during the later years of Hirohito's regency, thanks to the throne's view of them as dangerous. The film Eros Plus Massacre, though produced 40 years later, details perhaps the most prominent example of this, when anarchists Osugi Sakae and Noe Ito were killed by the military in the confusion following the 1923 Kobe earthquake. While the avant-garde may have been present during the Taisho period as well, the 1910s and 1920s perhaps most prominently produced the country's first true masters of cinema. Many of the names which would come to define the country's film output for decades started working here, with Kenji Mizuguchi, Yasujiro Ozu, and Shozo Makino among them. Makino is a special case, as though he had been working since the late Meiji period, it was in the Taisho period that he became remarkably prolific. Though few of his films have survived until today, he has been called the first true director from Japan, due to his artistic vision and envelope-pushing methods. The Taisho period also lays claim to the rise of the actress in Japan. Given the country's film lineage hailing from the stage rather than the photograph, the common practice of using men for all roles, both male and female, had naturally made its way into Japanese cinema. An entire class of actors known as onagata existed early on, known to specifically play female roles alongside their male counterparts. By late Taisho, however, the culture and the democratic changes of the country created an environment in which women could make a living as actresses, leaving onagata almost entirely in the past. As the short Taisho period ended, it also gave birth to some of the earliest film studios of Japan. Many have come and gone over the years, but with independent films still decades off, studios were just about the sole producers of feature films at this time. While most of the studios which cropped up during the Taisho period have long since folded, the country's longest-running film house was founded during Taisho, that being Nikatsu, who celebrated their 100th anniversary in business in 2012.
After struggling with illness for the better part of his adult life, Yoshihito passed away at the age of 47 on December 25, 1926. Following his passing, Yoshihito came to be known as Emperor Taisho, and his eldest son, Hirohito, ascended the throne at 25. Thanks to Hirohito's militaristic upbringing and the hero worship of his grandfather, Emperor Meiji, as well as Japan's expanding empire, following Hirohito's rise to emperor, the country quickly descended into a military state for a decade and a half. This movement began to be expressed openly in the 1920s, with the rise to prominence of fascist thought and the further suppression of political dissenters. Even those who sought to serve the emperor were not immune, as was seen in the case of Ikikita, a philosopher who influenced a military coup seeking to wrest power from the people and give it wholly to Hirohito. Kita's life and ideology would be explored 40 years later in the film Coup d'etat, which examined how his thoughts came to be and how they influenced a generation of military youth in Japan. In the middle of the 1930s, sound recordings were introduced into the world of film. For a time, sound and silent cinema coexisted alongside one another, thanks largely to the budgetary demands of adding a soundtrack to film reels. In Japan, this period was prolonged, likely due to the presence of the Benshi. These orators ensured the popularity of silent film for a longer time in Japan than in most other film-producing countries. Also during this time, more studios were founded and the Japanese film industry began to truly boom. This was most prominent in metropolitan areas like Tokyo and Kyoto, where the high density of people and the industrialized nature of these cities allowed for the construction of proper studios. With the growth of the studio system, along came more prominent directors throughout the 1930s and the 1940s. Among these directors were men like Mikio Naruse and Akira Kurosawa, two directors whose output would have long-lasting effects on generations of filmmakers to come. As Japan's air of militarization increased, so did the landmass of Japan's imperial holdings. The country expanded into mainland Asia and further into the many islands of the Pacific. At the same time, Hirohito, his advisors, and his various ministers elected to clamp down on artistic expression. The thought seemed to go that by unifying the artistic vision of Japan, the cultural zeitgeist could be unified and the citizenry would follow the wants of the leadership. The days of Taisho democracy and the avant-garde were over, as between 1937 and 1945, Japan became embroiled in nearly a decade's worth of active conflict. During these various wars, the artistic creativity of Japanese filmmakers was stifled. The studio system was reorganized thanks to the governmental mandate, combining ten studios into three conglomerates. These new studios were then required to produce films which embodied tales of Japanese gallantry and spirit, as well as what the leadership deemed to be the Japanese aesthetic. We discussed these changes in our video on Kenji Mizoguchi's interpretation of the 47 Ronin. Directors like Mizoguchi, who were allowed to continue working during the war years, were subject to strong censorship and railroading at the hands of the artistic censors of the era. Mizoguchi got off relatively light, adapting a historical tale for a contemporary audience. Others, meanwhile, were told to make films which amounted to more blatant propaganda concerning Japan's military engagements in the Pacific during World War II. While this censorship may have been withdrawn when World War II drew to a close on August 11, 1945, it was immediately replaced by another. Between 1945 and 1952, Japan was occupied by American military forces who were led by General Douglas MacArthur, the Allied commander of the Pacific Theater during World War II. The American film censors promoted the production of movies within the country, though they imposed their own restrictions. Namely, Japanese filmmakers during this period were not allowed to depict the preceding wars. More specifically, the two nuclear bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were completely taboo, meaning that most citizens of Japan had no idea about these attacks until the 1950s. Lastly, criticism of America at large and the occupying forces was off the table for filmmakers during the occupation. Instead, films made in this period favored a modern style and dealt largely with contemporary life and common struggles. On the channel, we've explored this with Mikio Naruse's Inazuma, a tale about a modern woman making her way in post-war Japan. At the tail end of the occupation, the first color film in the country, Carmen Comes Home, was released, marking another technological advancement. Internationally as well, the 1950s were an important time for Japanese film. Rashomon, one of Akira Kurosawa's most well-known projects, was awarded an American Academy Award, ensuring his popularity abroad. 
Several years later, once the American occupation had gone home, the world was introduced to Godzilla and his kaiju kin who stomped across screens in Japan and across the globe, albeit in a heavily modified form recut with additional footage of American actors for a foreign market. Films criticizing the war and the American occupation were quick to follow the Americans' departure, Godzilla among them. The first films to speak on the atomic bomb were produced not long before everyone's favorite scaly beast took to representing its next incarnation, the hydrogen bomb. What's more, the first surviving film directed by a woman, which itself provided social commentary on the occupation, was released in 1953, that being Kinuyo Tanaka's Love Letter. Technically, Tanaka's directorial debut was the second film from the country to be directed by a woman, but the earlier film no longer exists. As the 1950s drew on into the 1960s, one of the holdovers from the American occupation began to play an important role in Japanese politics and culture, that being student self-government. In 1948, the organization Zengakuden, or the All Japan League of Student Self-Government, was founded, ensuring that university students would have a say in the policies and rules of their schools. With the ideological censorship of the early Showa period behind them, Zengakuren became a breeding ground for a new generation of anarchists, socialists, and communists. Not only did they affect policy though, Zengakuren and their working class contemporaries had a hand in occupying campuses and protesting proposed laws or construction jobs they saw as leaning toward a new age of imperialism. Films like Heroic Purgatory explore the student movement, including all the ideological and emotional turmoil that it encapsulated. Political Descent of the Era was also popular and arguably some of the first independent filmmakers of the 1950s and the 1960s, like Nagisa Oshima who examined racism and capital punishment in Death by Hanging. As Japan's younger generation fought to gain a sense of identity, not all was grim. The 1960s and 1970s also brought on an event known as the Economic Miracle. After two decades of occupation and reconstruction, the country experienced an unprecedented period of economic growth. Truly, the country made its reintroduction onto the international stage in this time, especially during the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, as a symbol of growth and prosperity. Decades later, these Olympic Games would be used to represent how radically the country was changing in films like From Up on Poppy Hill. The 1960s also saw an increase in popularity of the Western aesthetic. Filmmakers like Seijun Suzuki with films such as Youth of the Beast showed how rapidly the pendulum had swung in terms of fashion, where the Meiji and Taisho periods saw the popularity of European and American dress. The cultural censorship of early Showa had provided a reason for these trends to go out of style. With the 1950s and 1960s bringing new attention to Japan, however, imports of foreign ideas and styles had begun anew. Just prior to the Olympics, the country also saw its high point for cinema attendance. Film was becoming cheaper to produce than ever before, wartime deficits of material were no longer necessitating restrictions on production, and the citizenry finally had disposable income once more. Pulp films were churned out at an impressive rate, a practice which would continue for decades to come, as with manga adaptations like Wolf Guy and Doberman Cop in the 1970s. The 1960s also saw the introduction of long-running series, another popular trend for decades, with projects like Stray Cat Rock, Outlaw Gangster VIP, and Sister Street Fighter. At the time, color and black and white films were shot alongside one another. The transition to full color wouldn't come for a while, with the film stock at the time being dependent on project budgets as well as the filmmakers' and stars' notoriety. This could be seen in films like Massacre Gun and Retaliation, which also served to illustrate another trend of the 1960s. During this time, Yakuza films became excessively popular thanks to their relatively cheap nature and quick turnaround. Their popularity was also supposedly due to Yakuza money being invested in the film industry, particularly in Toei. Yakuza films, as well as the aforementioned manga adaptations, survived the decade, but already in the 1960s, cracks were starting to show in Japanese cinema. The 1964 Olympic Games had increased television ownership exponentially, meaning that ticket sales fell off drastically. By the 1970s, the full effects of the changing times were felt. Between the late 1960s and the early 1980s, cinema attendance was down in a huge way. 
This led to film budgets being slashed further than was already common. It also necessitated that the average production schedule become only a month, 28 days from pre-production to having a screenable film. The formulaic program pictures we spoke on from the 1960s continued to be pumped out during the 1970s, with new releases being expected almost weekly from the major studios. New movements arose contemporary to this, like pinky violence and the pink film. Most of these new film types adhered to the quick production schedule, but attempted to appeal to the lowest common denominator. They often used sex and violence to draw in an audience, as we see in projects like Horrors of Malformed Men or Orgies of Edo. Even staples like the Yakuza picture couldn't remain stagnant, especially when produced in as high volume as they were. In the mid-1970s, Kinji Fukusaku revolutionized the Yakuza film by marrying fictional storytelling with a documentary style in films like Street Mobster and both of his Battles Without Honor or Humanity series. These new Yakuza were also ridiculously gritty and violent compared to their romantic forebears, thus sharing common ground with the base nature of pink violence or the pink film. At the same time, outliers bucked these trends thanks to studio desperation. Where long-running series had failed them, they risked money and time on films like House or Female Prisoner Scorpion, which no doubt would have been turned down a decade prior. Other filmmakers like Seijun Suzuki became trailblazers thanks to their independence, as was seen in his 1980s and 1990s Taisho trilogy. As Suzuki was creating his remarkable trilogy, a new generation of quick turnaround projects came into being. Moving into the end of the Showa period, one final major movement emerged thanks to another new technological advancement. The invention of home video provided a new means of distribution for film, giving way to straight-to-video movies. This we explored in our examination of V-Cinema, the name given to straight-to-video films in Japan, in our video on Takashi Miike's Black Society trilogy. While this trilogy may have not arrived until the mid-1990s, during the period following Showa, it was the logical conclusion of a decade's worth of low-budget home releases. With the invention and wide dispersal of camcorders, independent films also became more viable. This in turn led to a new group of filmmakers who would achieve prominence in the 1990s and 2000s, but who got their start during the 1980s. Projects like Death Powder may not have been possible without these advancements, meaning that no matter how small these films may have seemed at the time, in the future their influence would come to be known. Before moving on from the late Showa period, we ought to cover one major development independent of film technology. From the 1960s through to the late 1980s, the end of the era, Japanese animation started making its way out of the country and into the homes of international viewers. There were several popular series in the 1960s and 1970s which helped introduce anime to a western audience. However, major releases like Akira and the dispersal of low-quality VHSs in the 1980s were when the art form began to make more of a splash. The generation of Japanese citizens after Taisho and early Showa openly questioned World War II and Japanese imperialism in their films, showing how the country grew over this period. Speaking of anime, almost every project by Hayao Miyazaki for Studio Ghibli is applicable here, with Miyazaki weaving anti-war messages into many of these films. Numerous directors slightly older than Miyazaki who served in the war also criticized Imperial Japan, as seen in films like Blue Christmas. Other contemporaries, like Nagisa Oshima, called into question the country's role in the world in the 1940s with projects like Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Still others, like best-selling author Yukio Mishima, attempted to keep the imperial dream alive, as with his only directorial effort, patriotism. While these two sides of the argument fought back and forth on how the 20th century in Japan should be remembered, others focused on post-war triumph, as with 1982's Antarctica, which explored the human condition in a more universal sense. On January 7, 1989, Hirohito passed away at the age of 87. Following his death, he came to be known as Emperor Showa, and his eldest son, Akihito, assumed the throne. Beginning January 8th, Akihito would reign for 31 years during the Heisei period. Unfortunately, while late Showa had been marked by economic miracle and rebounding, the first two decades of Heisei were marred with strife. Within only a few years of Akihito becoming emperor, the country entered into a period known as the Lost Decade. 
a moniker later lengthened to the lost 20 years. The 1990s and early 2000s are remembered for their widespread economic disenfranchisement brought on by the burst of the country's bubble economy. The miracle had more or less been predicated on the inception of this bubble, which grew for about 30 years before finally collapsing. Simultaneously, unemployment exploded, leading to authors and filmmakers expressing the contemporary malaise through their fiction. We've explored this multiple times in the show with films like Tokyo Decadence, Ichi the Killer, Sonatine, Hanabi, Dead or Alive, Visitor Q, and Happiness of the Katakuris. While many of the heavy hitters from early Heisei focused on these dark times, other filmmakers looked to the positives and for a way to define this new world and their selves. These sentiments would produce films like Love Letter, Shinjuku Boys, Suzaku, and Welcome Back Mr. McDonald, some of the most heartfelt, hilarious projects we've covered to date. Not all was well, of course, with the rise in new problems like hikikomori, socially withdrawn shut-ins as explored in American hikikomori, and classroom breakdown, the loss of student control by teachers, as seen in the ever-controversial Battle Royale. With the spread of home video, the 1990s also saw the continued growth of otaku culture. Post-modern love letters to anime begin to emerge, like otaku no video. Further examples of anime staples, like Ghost in the Shell, also made their way outside of Japan. With the growth of the market, smaller properties cropped up left and right as well, like Video Girl Eye. Fan sub communities in and outside of Japan established in late Showa continued to grow throughout early Heisei. Some, like Animego, even went on to become legitimate incorporated distributors of anime abroad, further cementing the importance of Japanese film worldwide. The otaku movement was not immune from its darker sides, of course, even warranting its own examination in the later 1990s with films like Perfect Blue. As the internet came into being in the mid-1990s, a new movement began to introduce Japanese film to the globe, J-horror. This industry allowed for both big-budget blowouts as well as the further growth of new independence. Some used the J-horror movement to express discontent growing up in a generation of poor economy and false promises. Others used J-horror to address contemporary issues like the nation's astronomical suicide rate. All of these issues are perhaps most prominent in Shion Sono's films Suicide Club and Noriko's Dinner Table. For the most part, massive quantities of less cerebral horror were exported even into the 2010s, including new and old titles. Films like Uzumaki were created specifically for an international market, while found footage masterpieces like Noroi went viral. 1977's House found new popularity in 2011, when English-speaking internet users came across it. In the mid-2000s, even minor titles like Dark Tales of Japan became somewhat popular in the West thanks to the marketability of Japanese horror. Video game adaptations like Aoni burst into the scene via the internet, gaining cult followings globally. Subtle terror found in films like Confessions went on to encapsulate the disenchantment of the previous two decades, expressing this discontent to the world. World. What's more, while he had been working for the better part of Heisei, one of Takashi Miike's introductions to the West was Audition, one of the most notorious horror films perhaps ever. While horror directors found an efficient outlet for the troubles of the last 20 years, a different, sometimes overlapping, set of dramatic filmmakers expressed the bubble burst rebound in the 2010s. These filmmakers would also examine contemporary disaster and the finding of a new self in the modern world. In a global, cosmopolitan sense, Heisei's Twilight Years brought Japan international recognition for its cinema, with new hits like Departures, Spirited Away, and Your Name. These successes, in part, led to international commercial viability for Japanese and Japan-centric films, such as Terraformars, Cat Heaven Island, Makia, Lou Over the Wall, and the night is short Walk On Girl. In the face of struggle, some turned to telling heartwarming tales like Key of Life and Our Little Sister. In 2011, Japan experienced a terrible natural disaster, the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, which affected a nuclear meltdown in Fukushima. Directors and writers after this began to express consternation over disaster, as well as the government's response. Films like Shin Godzilla, Himizu, and shows like Tokyo Vampire Hotel all embodied these anxieties in unique ways. Films speaking openly about the darker parts of society also began to garner major attention, such as shoplifters and mental. All the while, existential questions begin to arise once more as Japan sought a sense of self in the 21st century. To name a few, these questions were incorporated into films like Ami.exe, Tag, A and A2, 
Love Exposure, Eureka, Paranoia Agent, A Bride for Rip Van Winkle, Liz and the Bluebird, and Who's Camus Anyway? Amid all the questioning, popularity, and commerce, Emperor Akihito expressed his interest in abdicating from the chrysanthemum throne. Though not explicitly allowed for in Japanese law, the Diet in turn passed a special bill to allow Akihito's wish. After several years of planning and thought, the day has finally arrived, and Heisei is set to end as Akihito steps down from his position as emperor at the age of 85. Today, as the Heisei period ends, Akihito becomes the first Japanese emperor to abdicate in two centuries, breaking tradition with all other modern emperors. As Akihito becomes Emperor Heisei, his eldest son, Naruhito, ascends at the age of 59, marking the beginning of the Reiwa period. Upon unveiling this new name, the government suggested the English translation of Bountiful Peace, though critics quickly noted that the first character, Rei, has an authoritarian tone to it. This is chalked up to the difference in meaning of the character between its original context in the Manyoshu and in modern Japanese, the former being something like bountiful, and the latter suggesting control. With the fourth era of Japanese cinema now behind us, one has to wonder. Each period has been defined by its own unique movements and changes. We might question then, what will the cinema of the Reiwa period bring? There's only one way to find out, and that's to continue studying Japanese film, just as we do here on Cinema Nippon. Be sure to stay tuned and find out along with us what the future of Reiwa will hold. <laughs>